There's something else that I, that I meant to write before we started, but maybe I'll just write it again real quick. Um, so, so we were discussing this Lindstrom Gessel, you know. So that, that if you have some graph G, directed graph, you have some sources, S1 up to Sn, and some sinks T1 up to Tn. Um, and let's say that the, the graph is acyclic, okay, so there is no cycles. Um, Let's say that Aij is the number of paths from vertex Si to vertex Tj. And let's assume that all routings from S to T take vertex Si to vertex Ti for i from 1 to n, okay? And so then the punchline of this is that the number of those routings from s to t was given by this um, very simple thing. It's just the, the determinant of the matrix given by, by these AIGs. Um, and so we were kind of doing some applications of this, and and I want to keep I want to keep doing that today. So today is like fun with determinants part two. We're gonna keep doing more of this, stuff, okay? Um, and I want to start by considering the problem of counting the number of tilings of this type of a regular hexagon. Side length n with unit rhombi. Okay. Rhombi is the plural of rhombus, and uh, so the unit rhombi. There's three directions that they can take. Like this, like this. I work so hard to make this picture pretty and now I can't even draw rhombus. That's rhombus and like this. Okay. So we're going to count the tilings uh, like this one. Yeah? That clock right here. Oh yeah. Sure. Okay, number of tilings of a regular hexagon of side length n with uh, unit rhombi, these rhombi all have angles of 60 and 120 degrees. Um, so, okay, some, some of you walked in, you, you had various impressions about this picture, um, and, uh, and one, one thing that you were saying is, okay, that, it's, that, that, it, that it looks like a staircase. So, if you, it does have kind of a three-dimensional quality to it, right? And uh, it's going to be going to look more three-dimensional if I take all the let's call these the vertical rhombi, and I'm just going to sh shade them in. Okay, so I take each vertical one and I shade it in. So it's going to be easier for you to see them for me, so I might have to ask you for your advice several times. Um, so now it looks more three-dimensional, I think. And uh, some of you are seeing one picture and the others are seeing the other picture, which is whether it's inside out or outside in. So we should choose what's the floor and what's the ceiling so that we can agree. So let's say 
again, there's, there's two points of view. Both are perfectly fine, but we're going to say that, that this is up. Okay. So this is the floor. This is the ceiling. Okay. And then you you can think of this as a kind of a, a stack of cubes, right? Mm -hmm. Like this in the little box. Okay. Um, so here's a here's a nice lemma. Proof that the number of vertical tiles is exactly n squared. Well, actually, if you look at this three-dimensionally, it's kind of obvious. Because if I look at it from this point of view, then these green tiles are basically you know, the things that are right above the floor. Right? If, I, if I shine a green light from over here, I'm going to hit exactly those nine tiles, which, is, which are going to be the, the three by three floor. So there's n squared, in, in general, here n equals 3, but in general, n squared green tiles, and then there's also going to be n squared of this kind, n squared of this kind. That's really not obvious without this three-dimensional picture, but with, but with it, it's, it's pretty clear. Yeah? I keep seeing the two different ones. Which one are we using again? So maybe one thing that we will do is... So let me draw the floor here. Okay. Here's the floor. It's a three by three. It's a three by three square. Okay. And now let me just say above each one of these squares, how many cubes did I stack? Okay. So you see, these three are, are on the floor, and there's no cubes on there. So I put a zero, a zero, and a zero there. Okay. Let me make it green so that it, so that it indicates cubes. So zero cubes here, zero cubes here, zero cubes here. Okay. Now, what's at height one? I think this one and this one are at height one. So that means I put one cube here, one cube here, and here I have two cubes. Right? And then these guys are at height three. So. Okay. So, okay. Well, here what we just showed is our R, R n is the number of ways of stacking cubes in an n by n by n boxes. So that. Gravity is in effect, so they, they have to land like that. Um, and uh, but I could also just look at these numbers, and these numbers are enough to tell me exactly what this what the cube uh, collection is, right? So I can just look at these numbers. Now, what do these numbers have to satisfy? Because gravity is in effect, uh, you see that the numbers have to increase in this direction, and they have to increase in this direction. So numbers are increasing in this direction and in this direction. Okay. So it has to be like stacked. It can't be like but you could jump by more, more than one. Like here we jump from one to three. But they just have to increase in that direction because, because you know, gravity is acting in this way. And so if you have more cubes over here, then they would fall. And so, OK, well, this is what's called a. a Plane partition uh, n by n square with entries less than or equal to n. Okay? I just keep the water bottles in the way then. Thank you. Is it in your way? No. Okay. I was worried because they're not. <laughs> um, Is there any way to count the number of cubes otherwise? So, so for example, how many cubes did I put here? Actually, it's just the sum of those numbers, right? Yeah. yeah. And so you could ask the finer question of, you know, what what are what is the number of ways of doing this with exactly k cubes? 
And that's a that's an uh, that's an interesting refinement, which which I'll, what I'm going to do today also works to do that. Um, the point is, okay, so I, I want to count this, but it's very unclear how I'm supposed to count this. And so I'm kind of trying to rephrase it in some way, so maybe I rephrase it like this. And uh, I'm still not clear how you're supposed to count this. Um, but what I'm going to do is that I'm going to do the following thing. So let me, let me put a little ant here, okay, and, le and let's have this ant walk, walk across this tile, okay, or if you want to think of it three-dimensionally, it's kind of walking around this box, and what it does is it just, it just crosses each box just orthogonal to it, okay, so you just cross over here, maybe the red will be a little bit easier to see, so I start over here, then I walk across, and I walk across, 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 across. Okay. And uh, let's put a, let's make another one start over here. And again, it goes across, 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 across. And let's make another one start over here. And go across, across. A simple way of saying this is that I took every hexagon of this type and I just cut it in half down the middle. Okay. But it's useful to think of it as something that's starting over here, ending over here, because now maybe you see what this has to do with a non-intersecting paths, right? I mean, here, these are th these paths that are not going to collide with each other. Okay. And uh, I'm going to just try to forget about the whole picture here and just write down the paths, okay? So these three points are these three points. Okay, so this guy went, and please help me if I made a mistake, because it's hard to see from up here. So this guy just zigzags. This guy goes one to the right, two to the left, two to the right, one to the left. And this guy goes right, left, right. Question? So yeah, I want to pretend if um, we had these red paths, like say they did intersect, what that would mean in terms of our cube, or our end box full of cubes, like would it violate gravity? The laws of gravity? Um, so I think it is clear that when I do this, these paths don't intersect. Right. And so what you're trying to understand is, okay, well if I were to draw paths that did intersect, what would that look like over there? It would look like an ugly picture that doesn't work, so you should try it, but I think... Uh, I mean, I guess, so let's see, for example, if, if we made... Um, how can we make them cross? Um, like put a cube like, if, like if you if you took this guy over here, uh -huh. instead of going like this, you go like this, Yeah. then it's like you're trying to overlay tiles here that, that can't really go there. To put a cube there that doesn't supposed to go there? I can't really see any three-dimensional. I think the three-dimensionalness is broken. It's more like instead of putting a tile like this and a tile like this, I want to put them in the other direction and they get in the way of each other. Oh, okay. And the, and the three-dimensional quality of this picture is just shot. These guys don't intersect. Okay. Um, okay, so I think it's clear then that from a tiling like this, I get a routing. Okay, a routing in what graph? Uh, routing in this graph uh, from top to bottom. In this graph, that we might call GN. Okay, but I I I didn't draw the whole graph because I think it'll be harder to see when I draw it. But you should just imagine that the graph consists of all the possible diagonals, uh, like this. It's just a grid, but it doesn't have the horizontal edges because this guy would never take horizontal steps. It just goes like this and like this. Okay. And uh, and so it's from the tiling I can get a routing, okay. And now what I claim is that this is actually a bijection. 
And uh, well, this is one of these things that it takes a moment thought. Maybe I recommend that at this point you kind of, you're, if you're watching the video, pause it. If you're not watching it, then go back and do this later on. Just try to do this and, and fill in the timing, okay? But it's kind of clear what you should do. Whenever you see a diagonal like this, then um, whenever you see a diagonal like this, then you should put a tile like this. Whenever you see a diagonal like this, you should put a tile like this. Right? And then you'll get a bunch of tiles, and then you should convince yourself that when you're done, then the other vertical tiles just fit beautifully and, and complete the tile. Okay? Again, it's one of these things that if I were to try to write a proof, I would just bore you to tears. Uh, and really, the best way to understand it is just to carry it out. You know what, actually? I, I said I we were going to do light homeworks from now on, and this is going to be your light homework. Is, uh, is to take a picture like this and make a tally. And then I think you'll see that, that this is pretty... Uh, it's pretty clear, actually, when you do it, that it works. Okay, so now this is great because that means that we actually have a technique to do this, right? We, we have a technique for computing these routes. And uh, so it's given by some determinant, right? And the determinant, all I need to do is just figure out what are the interests of the determinant by figuring out how many paths can, can I find from these guys to these guys. So this is my source one, source two, source three. This is sync one, sync two, sync three, okay? And um, so let's try to figure out so I'm not going to use this anymore. I'm going to erase it. Let's try to figure out how many paths there are. From SI to TJ, OK? So what is R I J? OK? Uh, let me. Let me kind of draw a schematic picture of the graph here. Okay. So I don't know, S I is here, T J is here. And I have to figure out how many ways are there of walking from S I to T J. Yep. Is that counting routing or paths? So the, remember the, the R I J the, the individual R I J's are just counting paths. So like the I I J's. So these are so maybe I'll call them A I J so that's These are the, the same AIJX. Okay, so I just need to count these paths. How many are there? Well, it's actually pretty easy to. It's actually the same thing as, as we did last time. How can you walk from SI to TJ? Well, you know, there's kind of a a lowest path, which is if you kind of make all the um, if you take all the steps left first, and then you take all the steps right. It's like the leftmost path you can take. The rightmost path you can take is to take all the right steps first and then go left. And then basically you, you just need to wiggle between these, these paths. And we know that's a binomial coefficient where you just choose that out of the number of steps which ones go this way, which ones go this way. Okay. Now, how many steps does this take? 2n, right? Because I'm at the bottom, I need to get at the top. And uh, from, from, from the bottom to top, I need two n steps, right? n in this direction, n in this direction. Well, no. if I were to walk from here to here, it would be n and n. Okay. But the trouble is that if, you know, if I start here and I take n steps in each direction, then I'm going to land in sj. I don't want to land in sj. I want to land in si. So what I need to figure out is how many steps are there of this kind and how many steps are there of this kind. And so that means I just need to measure how long is this, how long are those seconds. Okay. So, and maybe it's useful if I actually just think about, okay, what would happen if I were to um, go, like 
I said, instead of going from SI, what if I left from SJ? If I went from SJ, then I know that I would just need to take n steps this way and then n steps this way, right? So this this length is n, and this length is n. But, but now, how long is this little blue piece here? It's actually the same length as this one, which is j minus i. Mm -hmm. This is this, which is j minus i. Okay. And so that means that I need to take uh, how many how many steps in this direction? I need to take n plus j minus i steps in this direction, and then. The remaining n plus i minus j, right? So that they add up to two n. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So what's the number of ways of doing that? It's just two n, which is the total number of steps. Choose n plus i minus j. That means that I get a formula, which is just the determinant of the matrix with these entries. Now, I hope if you if you like this kind of problem, that this serves as good motivation to try to learn how to compute a determinant like this, because you know it's okay, it's a formula, but this is the nicest formula that we can get. Can we write something nicer? Okay. Um, I'm going to erase this. You remember this, right? I'm going to erase this. And uh, so. Here's a, here's a fact. Again, it's kind of, well, maybe before I, before I say this fact, uh, let's try to figure out what this guy looks like. So for example, for n equals 3, what does it look like? Um, well, you see, down, down the diagonal, when i is equal to j, you just get 2n choose n. So down the diagonal, I get 6 choose 3. Okay. So it's going to be useful to, to write down Pascal's triangle so that I can have handy the, the binomial coefficients. Okay. So 6 choose 3 is this one, 20. Okay. 6 choose 3. Now, as i gets bigger, uh, so i gets bigger as you go down, right? As i gets bigger, then you want to choose 2n, choose bigger things, right? So let me, let, me, let me do this. So 6 choose 3. As i gets bigger, you get bigger binomial coefficients. So you get 6 choose 4, 6 choose 5. And as j gets bigger, you get smaller ones. So you get 6 choose 2, 6 choose 1. And, uh, and again, when so here I'm supposed to keep decreasing, so 6 choose 3, 6 choose 2, here I keep decreasing, 6 choose 4, 6 choose 3, okay? So if you look at it, actually, it's, it's, it's extremely simple what we're doing. We're just saying, okay, take, take this, this row of Pascal's triangle, the first and the last one never appear, only 6 choose 1 up to 6 choose 5 appear, and they appear in this order. So you just go 6, 15, 20, 15, 6. And then you, you keep going. 15, 20, 15, 20. It's a really beautiful determinant, actually. Okay. It looks uglier here, but it's, it's, a, it's a really nice one. Um, and I actually want you to try to compute this. 
So here's here's a okay, so here's a fact that I'm not going to prove is that there is a nicer formula for this determinant. Actually, there's two nicer formulas. One is this one, product from i equals 0 to n of 2n plus i choose n over n plus i. Okay. Very explicit, it's, it's a, a, a quotient of binomial coefficients. A quotient of products of binomial coefficients. Okay. And here's another formula that, I, that I, I, I like this formula a lot. So you, it's a, it's a triple product for i, j, k equals 1 to n. And what you're multiplying is i plus j plus k minus 1 over i plus j plus k minus 2. So, um, so it's, a, you know, it's a triple product, so that's a drawback, but then what you're multiplying is a lot easier. So that's an advantage. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is very easy to show. I mean, very easy. You have to kind of, okay. the point is you can just multiply all of this out and see that these are the same thing. Okay. But this actually, this actually takes some cleverness to compute this determinant, and I want you to just think about how do you compute such a determinant, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, now that you don't have any hard homework to do it, I really think you should try this. And you know, if it was a if it was a hard homework, then you would do it. So just treat it like that and, and do it and put it in the in the form. Um, okay. Anyway, so that's that's uh, that's this really beautiful formula for the number of tilings of a hexagon into um, unit runway. Okay. And this is. Uh, also, we were talking about McMahon yesterday. If all majors in the army proved theorems like this, that would be pretty amazing. So this is the same McMahon who was a major in the British Army, and this, this theorem is due to him. Um, okay. So so that's how this works, and and uh, this. Uh, I wanted to show you this, well, first of all, because I think it's really beautiful, um, but also so that you understand that actually uh, tiling problems are very, very closely related to routing problems. And uh, actually, there's many different tiling problems that can be rephrased in terms of routing problems. And the great thing is that for routing problems, we have this general technique uh, that allows us to, to count them. So, and so yeah, I mean, there's, there's really a vast theory of, of, uh, of formulas for tilings of various regions. And uh, the people in that theory are some of the best people in the world that are at computing big determinants. Because you need, to, you need to get good at computing things like this and simplifying to get like that. Okay. So, so, so yeah. Well, just turn Oh okay, yeah, so that's that's a really good point. So why on earth is this an integer? Well, actually, the only reason that I know is that it's this integer. But uh, you know, a hard number. Well, I don't know how hard it is. I haven't tried. But an interesting number theory homework would be to just give you this number and ask you to prove that it's an integer. Um, and this happens a lot. In that. In this whole theory, you get all these all these formulas that are quotients of things, and it's not at all clear why that should be an integer. But, but it is because it counts something. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to have it in me to erase this picture the whole hour. <laughs> I'm going to try not to. But, um, but I guess I'll erase these other ones.
Maybe just a brief comment about this, that uh, the thing about computing determinants and getting these kinds of formulas is that, I don't know, it seems to me that by the definition of a determinant, a determinant doesn't want to be a product of things. At least by the usual definition as, you know, a sum over the n factorial permutations of a bunch of things, pluses and minus. It's, it's very hard to predict that when you get that, you should get a number that factors very nicely. Okay? Um, and so usually this is not really the best way to prove to prove results like this. There is a multiplicative version of determinants, which is, is the product of the eigenvalues of the matrix. Okay? And so if you somehow can pull off computing the eigenvalues of the matrix, then this is this is this gives you a product formula naturally, and hopefully it is it is this one. Okay. So that's one way to do it. And then the other way to do it, and we we, we did some of this last time, is that you you at least have these tricks of like, you know, doing raw operations. If you do raw operations, then then the determinant doesn't change. And then if you if you take out if you have a common factor in a row, then you can take it out and that's a factor. And so that's that's also a common technique is is just to use these row, row and column operations and just you know, it, identify factors, take them out, and eventually end up with the product that you want. Yeah? Is there anything known about the eigenvalues of the, the matrices created by those, the, the AIJs? Um, so the question is whether something is known about, about the, the determinants of these AIJ matrices. Uh, the, yeah, the, the, the matrix where AIJ is the number of paths from I to J. Not in general. I mean, if, if, if we did, then we would then all of these things would be very easy. Um, but it just happens that in a lot of cases of combinatorial importance, those matrices just behave more nicely than, than the average matrix would. Okay. But yeah, I mean, like, like I said, there's a big business of... of of uh, trying to understand the, the linear algebra properties of graphs. Algebraic graph theory is a massive field, and, and there's a lot of very strange phenomena there where matrices that shouldn't have nice eigenvalues actually have very nice eigenvalues. Okay. Um, so let's, let's do something else. Do some uh, some more examples because basically we we can apply this this stuff to any graph that we like and uh, try to get determinantal formulas for things that we like. And so, for example, one thing that we might wonder is what is this determinant? These are Catalan numbers. Again, this, this might have seemed like a very hopeless question, um, but, uh, but now at least we have some possibility of, of, we have a tool to do this, which is, you know, that there is an interpretation of this determinant as, as uh, in terms of routings, if these CIs are certain numbers of paths. But the thing is that, you know, the Catalan number is given in terms of, number of paths, so that's actually quite likely that this could work. So CN is a Catalan number. Um, so the first one is 1, the determinant of 1 is 1, the second the after 1 is 2, and then 5. Five minus four is one. And then the next one is, is fourteen. The next one is forty-two, I think. Anybody know offhand? I think this is I think this is the next first. I think these are the first Catalan numbers. Uh, so if you do this, you get one. Uh, okay. 
so so why one? Well, we know that this this has the potential of being the number of routing somewhere. Okay, so what should we do? We should uh, think. Think of building a graph that sort of things. And that graph should have um, source vertices, S1, S2, up to S. I guess let's call it S0, S1, up to Sn. And target vertices T0, T1, T2, up to T. So let's try to build this graph. So this is the number of routings in some graph that we're trying to construct. Okay. So, okay, well, let's put a zero somewhere. Actually, maybe I'll go down here because I might need more room. So now I need to choose vertices T0, T1 up to Tn, so that the number of paths from S0 to Ti is the ith catalan number. So what do you think I should do? It seems kind of natural that you should just let these be dick paths, or dyke paths. Right? So I'll, I'll accomplish this by letting T1 be here, T2 be here, T3 is here. Let's do n equals 4, for example. Okay. Um, so what is my graph here? Well, I'm thinking that this, this is like, these are uh, dike paths, right? So I don't know, if I want to get from S0 to T3, then I can go like this. The number of ways of doing that is the, the Cadillac number. Where's T0? Where should I put T0? I want there to be one unique path from S0 to T0. And actually, it seems like I should just put it right here. That seems fine. OK, so there's an underlying graph here, right? Which is uh, that's my graph. Right. Now, where should I put S1? You're signaling to put it here. So what's the number of dike paths from S1 to T2? It's the third Catalan number, right? Which is good because from S1 to T2, I want the third Catalan number. Yeah, and I can keep doing this. So S2, S3, S4. Okay. And, uh, and then I just keep keep doing this, right? So. So that's, that's going to be my graph, okay? And uh, do we agree that the number of paths from Si to Tj is the Catalan number i plus j? Here, Aij, the number of paths from Si to Tj. And because the distance from Si to Tj is i plus j, this is the Catalan number. I plus J, which is what I have here. Okay. Um, so this is the number of routings from my set S to my set T in this graph. Okay. So now let's. Oh, okay, and I, I guess I, I, it's implicit that my edges are oriented like this and like this, right? <coughs> so that these are like dike path style edges. 
And so now I want to figure out what are the routings from the S's to the T's. Now I think it's clear that, that if I want a routing, then I am going to have to send SI to TI. Okay. In fact, S0 has to go to T0 because it's already there. Okay. Now S1, where does it go? Well, if, if it went past T1, then nobody could hit T1. So S1 has to go to T1. How does S1 get to T1? Actually, there's a unique way that avoids this guy. Just to go like this, and then this. Now, S2, again, you have to send it to T2. And to not collide with the rest, then you have to go like this, like this. And then S3 has to go to T3. And S4 has to go to T4. Okay, so this means that there's, a, there's really a unique way of doing this. Number of routes in this graph is actually one. There's only one. It's very trivial. So, and so that's it. Okay. Extremely simple. It's like deceitingly simple. But think about what's going on behind the scenes here. Remember that this was this. This is this massive determinant. It's counting all the ways of of taking all the paths from SI to TJ, and then there's all this magic cancellation going on. And so, even though this in principle had lots and lots of terms. They all cancel, except for the routings. And the routing here is just one trivial routing. Okay. So that's, that's what's happening here. Okay. So this is a proof that this determinant is equal to 1. Um, and let me give you an exercise that is that is uh, pretty easy from here. Um, so I'm realizing that actually th this isn't really correct because C zero is one, but C one is also one, right? So here, what I actually computed was this determinant. So, I mean, I, I did prove this one. I did prove that this is equal to 1. But the example that I did is for this one. But I claim that this is also true. Um, and, uh, OK, so, you know, an exercise is to, is to also give a proof of this. And you can imagine the proof is going to be similar. Um, but so then let me tell you a nice fact about this. This is the unique sequence satisfying these identities for every n. Simultaneously or? Simultaneously. So if you have an infinite sequence, a0, a1, a2, etc., such that when you compute this determinant, you always get one, and when you compute this determinant, you always get one, then your sequence is the Catalan numbers. It's a very, very strange definition of the Catalan numbers. You could define it by saying it's a sequence that satisfies this property. Quick question. So for this one that you, the graph that you made, where, where is C1? Mm -hmm. So what would be the routing? Like the C1, this one? Yeah. C1 is the number of paths from S0 to T1. And the number of paths from S0 to T1 is just this one. So yeah, you should think about how to modify this to give to give a proof of this one. You have another question? Yeah, I'm just thinking. I'm wondering if it should be obvious from the picture that we've drawn because it's symmetrical. So, like, would I expect the whole winter cancellation to happen because of the symmetry of this problem? 
No, I would I would say that the, the cancellation is much more magical than that. I mean, symmetry. There's a lot of symmetric problems in the world, and they're not they're not usually this simple. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's not true. Really, just like any sequence of numbers, consecutive numbers, you take like the the catalog numbers of like C I up to C J, and then you and then you do like create this determinant. It's not going to equal one. You know what? I'm I'm so glad like, that you. It, it seems like it correspond still to that. So it would come out to like it's just in the center. You would have the catalog number i, um, the number of like possible dike paths from the two things in the middle, but everything outside that would still be the term. I'm I'm really glad that you asked that because I was about that was the next thing that I wanted to say and I had forgotten, and I was about to move on. So I'm glad that you stopped me um, because. So, okay, so Matt's question is what happens when you don't start at zero or at one, but at any other number, okay? So let me actually start at n. And let this be k long. And I do the same thing. And oh, I I wrote this a little bit different in my notes, and maybe I shouldn't try to improvise and make it different. But So I'm, I'm doing, this is the same matrix, but kind of reversing the, the order of the rows on the columns. I just started with the, I started with this corner and then I went up instead of the other way around. I start with any Catalan number and then I, I go down K rows, K columns, okay? So, um, so what is this? Well, this is, it has some interpretation like this. So it's the number of, uh, by an argument like this, it's going to be the number of, of uh, things that look like something like that. Right? Mm -hmm. um, number of routings of this type, where I guess n is the biggest one, so that means that this guy has length 2n, right? mm -hmm. and I have K routes. And so here you can see that actually there's more, I mean if K is <coughs> that what I want? Um, yeah. And so, so you see that this number is not one anymore necessarily, right? Because here you have room to have different possibilities. So one, one thing that I wanted to talk to you about is, is this connection. Um, it's a very recent theorem that uh, says the following. This is also equal to the number of k triangulations of convex angle. And what is that? If you take a convex angle on like this. So what you do is that you draw a maximal set of diagonals. But you need to avoid So that no k plus one diagonals cross parallels. So let's think about what this is. 
So for example, let's let's think about what this is for k equals one. Okay. So I'm supposed to draw diagonals in here so that no two diagonals cross pairwise. Okay, pairwise is kind of empty here because we're talking about only two things. No two diagonals should cross. Okay? And so I'm supposed to draw diagonals however I want, but it should be a maximal set, right? So that there should be no crossing, but anything that I add creates a crossing. So when k equals 1, what is this? It's actually just a triangulation. You have to just take this thing and cut it into triangles. Okay. But now k is bigger. So for example, what if k is equal to 2? Then I can add more diagonals, because what I should avoid is to have three diagonals so that every two intersect. Okay. So for example, I could draw this diagonal. And I don't have three diagonals that intersect. I only have two that, that intersect. Mm -hmm. And I could draw this diagonal. Mm -hmm. and that's still mm -hmm. fine. But you see now, no matter what other diagonal I draw, I'm going to find, like for example, if I, if I draw this third diagonal, uh, then the three red diagonals would intersect. Pairwise. I don't want that. But actually, I think I, I can. I can add this diagonal, and I don't create any triples so that I need to intersect. It's a little hard to check, actually, but it turns out you can add all of these and that, and you don't really have an issue. So this is an example of a two-triangulation. It's a maximal set of edges so that no three diagonals intersect two by two. But if I add another diagonal, I'll break that up. So this is a generalization of triangulations. And uh, in particular, what happens when k is equal to 1? When k is equal to 1, um, this determinant ends at Cn. So this is just a determinant that only has one entry, which is the entry Cn. So when k is equal to 1, it says that Cn is the number of triangulations. So if, if you knew that, cool. And if you didn't know that, then you should know it. The number of, I mean, you now know it. The, the number of triangulations of an n gon, actually, sorry, this is an n plus 2 gon. The number of triangulations of an n plus 2 gon is the, is the Catalan number. And if you haven't seen this before, you should, you should try to prove it. It's, it's, uh, it's nice, and there's many different proofs. Okay, so that's a very classical fact. And this is a generalization now to, to k k triangulations. And I wanted to show you this because this is very recent. I mean, this, is, this result is from the last, maybe at, at most 10 years. It's, it's a very recent result by Jakob Jonsson. And actually, he left open the question of finding a bijection between these two sets. And this is something that people worked on for, for a long time, to, to find a bijection between these routings and these k triangulations. And this problem was just solved a couple years ago by Luis Serrano and Christian Stoff. Um, they, give a, they give a really beautiful bijection, actually. If, if you guys like bijections, this is a really interesting paper. Okay. Um, but yeah, so basically, Matt, great question, very interesting story. And one thing that's interesting about this, actually, is that there's, there's several open problems. Uh, several very interesting open problems. And let me just mention one very briefly. Um, so there is, OK, so th this, uh, you'll need to know a little bit about polytopes to make sense of what I'm about to say. But um, there is a very beautiful polytope such that the vertices, of, so this polytope is called the isosahedron. And the vertices of that polytope are in bijection with the triangulations of an n, of an n plus 2 gon. And this polytope is such that when you go from one vertex to a neighbor vertex, what you're doing is taking the triangulation. So maybe.
So you have some, some vertex that corresponds to this triangulation. Right? And now, to, to figure out what the neighbor vertices are, what you do is that you delete the diagonal. Let's say we delete this one. Okay. But now, I mean, you should get a vertex, so you should add another diagonal, right? So there should be a triangulation. And you see there's a unique diagonal that you can add, which is this one. Okay. So this is this is a neighbor of this because they differ by one flip. This is called the flip. So you can imagine actually this this guy has three neighbors, right? Because there's three diagonals that you could take out. Okay, so one, two, and three neighbors. So what dimension is this guy likely to live in? Uh, can't, it's supposed to be a polytope, so it can't be a polygon because in a polygon, a vertex only has two neighbors. And it cannot be in four dimensions because in four dimensions, a vertex needs to have at least four neighbors. So that means that this has to be a three-dimensional polytope. Okay. And it turns out that there is this beautiful three-dimensional polytope. It has 14 vertices. The vertices correspond to the triangulations, and you walk around the polytope by moving diagonals like that. It's a really beautiful story, a Okay. So, so that's the story of the isosahedron and triangulations. And there's a problem that I think is really beautiful and open right now, wide open, which is to do this for any k. And uh, we believe and. I mean, I haven't thought about this too carefully, but I did, I did this, the smallest example for k equals 2. That makes sense. And you do get this beautiful polytope. Uh, it's a four-dimensional polytope, and it's, it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing. But nobody can prove that. So, you know, there is a conjecture that there is a polytope called the k-associahedron. Whose vertices correspond to these guys? And nobody knows how to do it. So I think that's a really fascinating problem. Yeah, the dimension. Yeah, the dimension. It, yeah, it's known what dimension it should have. And it, I mean, there, there's some things known about what it should look like, but nobody can prove that it actually is a polygon. It's worth saying that, the, that actually for many years, nobody knew that the association was a polygon. So it's a conjecture that was open, I think, for a couple of decades. So. But anyway, that, I think that's a really interesting question. Okay. Um, okay. So, the last thing that I want to do today is now talk about these paths that you guys studied in your homework. And these are the paths where you can go up. I mean, you can go northeast, you can go southeast, or you can go. Uh, So Rn is the number of paths like this from 0, 0 to 2n0. These are called, I didn't tell you the name so that you wouldn't Google this too easily, but these are called Schroeder paths. Okay. So what if we try to do this? Now, for the Schroeder numbers. We know what this is. I mean, at least we, we have an interpretation of what this counts. Right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to start at one. Okay, so this is the number of routings in some graph, right? Oh, no.
Okay. So we have an interpretation for what this is. We know we know what this should look like. We know there's a grid. And this determinant is the number of routing somewhere. In a shorter graph, which I'm gonna try to draw real quick. Sorry, I'm going to take my time doing this because this picture. Actually, I'm trying to do something very ambitious right now, which is to draw a very difficult picture in life. We'll see how it goes. But I need it to look kind of decent, or you will, won't be able to see it. Okay. But what I do is think about what this determinant is in this graph. So, so what is it? Well, I mean, it's it's the same graph as before. Now the sources are going to be. This is S one, S two, S three. This is T one. This is T two, T three, and what are the edges? The edges are this. They are this. So that's the old Catalan graph, but now we have a new family of edges, which are too long, like this. This is length two. So we can go from here to here. It's a zero and T zero again. Oh, so no, actually here, I re-index here and I meant to re-index here also. So this is going to go from S1, T1, T2, T3, and so Okay. And so by the exact same argument, you know, this is the number of non-crossing routings using shutter paths. So let me draw one of these routings. So maybe, actually from S1 to T1, well, actually here there's two options, right? I can either go up or straight. So let me start by going straight. Okay. Now from here, actually, you see, I can't take a step right because I would hit the other guy. So the first step has to be up. And then I can do whatever I want. But the last step also has to go like this. And then from here to here, let's say that I do this, this, and this. One, two, three steps. This guy, same thing. I, I can't go right. I have to go up. And again, I can't go right. I have to go up. And then, depending on, on the rest, I, I might be able to. In this case, I can't go right, but, in, but if I had gone straight here, I could go right here. Similarly, these last two have to go like this. Okay. Now here, what should we do? Uh, well, again, I can't go right, so I'm going to have to go up. Here, I could go like this or like this. Let's say that I go like this, and then here, and then down, and then down. So this is an example of a router. And now I want to do a, uh, a trick. So I'm going to put some dominoes on top of this. And the way that I do that is that whenever I see an edge like this, then I'm going to put down a domino like this. Okay. And this is like two, right? So that so this this has the potential of being a domino. Now if I see this, then I'm going to put a domino like this. Okay. 
And again, this is diagonal of, le of length one, so this, this could very well be a domino. And then I do the same thing with these guys. And let's see what I get when I, when I overlay those dominoes on this picture. Can you see what's going to happen? I, I can't yet. OK, so let me get rid of all this junk. I don't need it anymore. So now, so I put the horizontals first. So there's one, there's one, there's one. Did I miss any? No. So those are my horizontal dominoes. Okay. Where do I get vertical dominoes? Well, for example, this diagonal gives me a vertical domino like this. This diagonal gives me a domino like this. This one gives me a domino like this. This one gives me a domino like this. Then I get one like this. And then I get one over here. Okay. Yeah, because those are forced. So I didn't draw the dotted ones because they're forced. Every every routing has those edges, and so actually I'm just gonna forget about this part of the picture, which is common to everybody. And I just want you to look at what happened here. What does this look like? It wants to be a domino tiling, clearly. And how can I make it look a little bit more regular? Um, you see, it's, it's a little bit like what happened here, right? I mean, when I, the rule that I used here for the dominoes is very similar to the rule that I used here. It didn't give me the whole tiling. I had to fill in some holes. And it's very clear that there's one hole that I should fill, right? This domino clearly wants to be part of the tiling. Do you see other dominoes that want to be part of the tiling? Two on top. Two on top. One here. And another one here. Okay. So here's the theorem. Number of routings in this graph. This graph. And this is equal to the number of domino tilings of this shape. This shape has a terrible name. It's called the Aztec Diamond 3. Always symmetric. Uh, no, actually, so the, I guess this has this very nice symmetry, right? That was an accident. This tiling is very symmetric, but but no. I mean, actually, if I ask you to, to make a non-symmetric tiling, you won't have any trouble doing it. Okay? So the fact is that there's a bijection between routings in this shorter graph and tilings of this aspect time. Why do I say that this is a, an awful name? I, tell, I learned this when I gave a talk about this in Mexico. And, and uh, they're like, dude, those aren't Aztec. I mean, because I guess <laughs> these, these, are, these are called Aztec diamonds because they look like pyramids, but the pyramids are Mayan pyramids, yeah. the ones that look like this. So maybe a better name would be Mayan diamond. Uh, sounds like a name. You know, these, these things happen, right? It's always like this. But anyway. Um, <laughs> And I want to make it clear, I didn't come up with that name. It was, it was actually somebody that told me that had studied the Mayas pretty uh, uh, deeply in the, in the Sin Vestap in Mexico. And, and, and uh, he told me that he would really like this to be called the Mayan diamond, so I'm following him. Um, anyway, number of domino tilings of the Mayan diamond, MD. Okay. 
So this is a bijection. Any questions about this bijection? And again, I, I think part B of the of the homework is going to be to do this for a for a Schroeder system of paths so that you can see that that uh, this really does work. I'm not I'm not lying. To you. Um, okay, well that that's cool, but that that's just a restatement of the problem, right? I mean, okay, so this is the number of diamonds, but how many diamonds? Now, do you remember the, what these numbers were? Because I know you looked at them very hard. So I remember we talked about we talked yeah. about this uh, with Hannah. So the the first one was two. I know I know that. The next one. Six. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so. So these are the shorter numbers. These are the numbers you computed in your homework. Right? Uh, two, six, six twenty-two. This determinant is forty-four. Minus thirty-six is eight. The next one. You compute this. Do you, you have any guesses? What's that? 16. 64. Close. These numbers are too nice. When you when you when you know the number the numbers factor so nicely, you know you're onto something. They're all powers of two. And what are the numbers? One, three, six. These are the triangular numbers. Oh, yes. And this is a theorem that the number of tiles of the Mayan diamond is 2 to the n times n plus 1 over 2. Um, really, really beautiful result in enumerative combinatorics. Um, this result is due to Elkis, Larson, Prop, and Shore, I believe, or jo no, Jokush, I think. Um, and uh, actually, it was it was preparing this class that I learned about this connection. I, did, I, I didn't know about this connection in this. I mean, I, I knew. Let, let me rephrase. This is a very standard trick in the theory of tilings, that to take questions about domino tilings or questions about rhombus tilings, and uh, and turn them into questions about rounds. That's you know one of the very standard tricks of the trade in tiling theory. Very beautiful trick. And then you get these determinantal things, OK? Um, but what I didn't know is that actually it is possible to give a nice computation of the determinant and through, through this, prove this formula. I had never seen that. And this is in a recent paper of, also oh, I, I wrote the references. This is a paper of Yu and Fu. Uh, and I wrote the names on the notes so that if you're interested, you can look at them. And in particular, the, the paper, the original paper of Elkis, Larson, Jokish, and Prop is a really, really beautiful paper that gives four different proofs of this result. None of the proof is as simple as you might think, actually. I mean, if the answer is 2 to the n times n plus 1 over 2, you would think, well, you know, it's, it's a bunch of binary decisions. It seems very easy. But there is no proof that is like, OK, this is obvious because of, because of this. Um, but they give four very nice proofs. Uh, going through, there's one kind of algorithmic construction of, of all the tilings that shows that the number of tilings is this. There's another one that's kind of determinantal. There's another really interesting one through representation theory of Lie algebras, uh, or maybe of the general linear group, I forget. Um, these things are kind of equivalent anyway. Um, but uh, but yeah, there's, there's, there's several really beautiful proofs, and uh, and maybe the next in the next class, what I'm going to do is just outline a different proof of this fact that is that is really nice. Um, all right.